Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Thomas Dupree, uh, and along with Matthew Connolly, I co-direct the Institute uh, of, for Social and Economic Research and Policy, also known as ICERP. Uh, the symposium uh, on meeting the challenge of COVID-19 in Africa, which begins today and will continue uh, through September 4th, is being sponsored by ICERP. I uh, just want to say a couple of words about, about us and about the new Center for Pandemic Research uh, and, um, and then uh, a few more inter introductory remarks. So ISERP is the Social Science Research Center uh, for Columbia's Social Science Departments in the Arts and Sciences and also uh, in the School for International and Public Affairs. ISERP currently manages nearly $30 million in research grants for Columbia faculty and provides research infrastructure for our faculty, including space for research, support for research computing, and other administrative support. ISERP also administers the quantitative methods in the Social Sciences MA program, and it supports a number of research centers, including ju the Justice Lab, the Tutoring and Learning Center, the Applied Statistics Center, the Computational Social Science Working Group, and many other workshops and activities, including a new book series for social science faculty and a large number of conferences. So the newest center at ISERP is the Center for Pandemic Research, which was started last spring to coordinate new work by Columbia social scientists on COVID-19. The first major initiative of the new center was a week-long online course on leadership and decision-making during pandemics, which took place under the leadership of Wilma James and Lawrence Stanbury last June. ISERP also issued a new round of pandemic-related seed grant funding jointly with the Columbia Population Research Center. Most recently, we announced a competition for a new round of seed grant funding for research that addresses the topic of countering vaccine hesitancy and scientific misinformation. And we expect to award a new round of seed grants on this topic in the fall semester. We hope this research will lead to important insights that strengthen the hand of science and that improve the efficacy of vaccine therapies and our ongoing struggle against the pandemic. Uh, the Center for Pandemic Research is the host and organizer of today's conference, and I want to acknowledge the leadership of Wilmot James for making possible a conference on this vitally important topic. I also want to acknowledge as partners the University of uh, Witwatersrand, particularly Dean Martin Veller, and also the Africa Centers for Disease Control. Several donors have helped make the symposium possible, and I want to thank and acknowledge Dr. Larry Stanbury, the Associate Dean for International Programs, and the Director of the Programs in Global Health at Columbia's Vagalos College of Physicians and Surgeons. And I also want to thank the Marion and Stanley Bergman Family Charitable Trust uh, and the Sandland Foundation. And then finally, I want to uh, say a few words by way of introduction about Wilmot James, who will be the session moderator for day one of this symposium. Uh, Wilmot's a senior research scholar at the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy. Uh, he's the author and editor uh, and or editor of 17 books, the most recent of which is the policy oriented Vital Signs, Health Security in Africa. He teaches a course on catastrophic risks and convenes high level meetings on planetary threats. He serves as an associate director of the program in vaccine education at the Vagalus College of Physicians and Service, uh, Surgeons here at Columbia. Uh, Wilmot is a senior consultant in biosecurity to the Washington DC based nuclear threat initiative. And he's also an honorary professor of public health at the University of uh, the Witwatersrand. And so now I wanna turn the uh, microphone, so to speak, back to Wilmot so that he can get the symposium underway. Thank you very much uh, to Tom for that very generous introduction. And just to um, affirm the thanks that is given to our partners and all to our donors, I just wanted to point out that uh, the University in South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, it's called the University of the Witwatersrand, which is Afrikaans Dutch for White Waters Reef, which is the gold bearing reef uh, on the land. So, because it's a long, difficult name, we call it Bits. Uh, so, uh, but uh, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, uh, Tom. Uh, let me just right at the outset, uh, thank Harla Wang, who coordinates this entire conference uh, on a technical and other level. And also thank uh, Lewis uh, Ruben Thompson, who was uh, an excellent student assistant to this uh, project. 
So uh, before I continue uh, as moderator, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Harlow Wang to take us through the Zoom etiquette uh, for today's session and for the rest of the week. Thank you, Dr. James. So I'm just going to say a quick note to our attendees. Um, welcome. Uh, we do welcome your uh, questions and participation through the question and answer function in the Zoom webinar. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that has some chat box uh, pictures and says Q&A. Um, if you click on that button, you'll be able to type in your questions. Um, you also have the option to view questions typed by other attendees and you can upvote them if you would also like to hear the answer to that question. So there's a small thumbs up sign attached to each question um, that uh, your peers type. And if you also would like to hear the, question, the answer to that question, please do um, thumbs up that question so that the panelists can see it. Thank you very much, uh, Harlow. And if I can now ask you to please uh, screen the taped address uh, by the WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of WHO, I'm honored to welcome you to this symposium on meeting the challenge of COVID-19 in Africa. We must learn the lessons of this pandemic for our response today and for the health emergencies of tomorrow. Let me offer three lessons we have learned so far. First, we're now seeing some signals of a downward epidemic trend in Africa, although several countries remain worrisome. Improvement doesn't mean it's time to relax. We must remain vigilant and not rush to remove safety measures we have put in place. Complacency can be deadly, and the threat of resurgence is a real one. A second lesson is that collaboration is critical to controlling the spread of COVID-19. That means working together across borders and across sectors. Nobody can take on this pandemic alone. Tackling this virus means we need to implement strong evidence-based public health and social measures and to develop and provide equitable access to medicines, diagnostics, and hopefully a vaccine. But with or without a vaccine, we can only bring this pandemic under control by following the public health basics. Testing, isolating and treating patients, contact tracing and encouraging strong compliance with measures in communities. Which brings me to lesson three, the most critical part of the response, public trust. Empowering communities and building public trust can only happen if we listen to communities and work with them to meet their needs. Trust must be earned by delivering on our promises. Last week, we celebrated the eradication of wild polio in Africa. That lesson is clear. The world can overcome any threat as long as we work together in solidarity. My best wish for a productive and provocative discussions in the coming days. I thank you. So in his absence, uh, if I can thank uh, Dr. Chedros uh, for his uh, message, but uh, in particular for his global leadership of the, the most stressful and challenging of circumstances given the pressures on the WHO presently. Um, and uh, he, together with uh, Dr. John uh, Kinzagong, who will give the keynote address tomorrow, have made a huge difference in how we've tackled uh, COVID-19 and other infectious outbreak, disease outbreaks like Ebola uh, uh, on the African continent. So um, if I can now introduce to you uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Tokmo uh, Maruta, 
his full bio is available on the program on the web link that we have. Um, but to say that he is the senior biosafety, biosecurity officer of the Africa Center for Disease Control, which as you know is based, uh, its headquarters is in Addis Ababa, uh, but it has links to five regional collaborating centers and, uh, and uh, Dr. Maruta is based at the Southern um, RCC, which is based in the uh, Saka, Zambia. He has a PhD and other qualifications uh, as well, but a PhD in public health. And uh, he's joined the Africa CPC recently. And I'm really, really delighted to introduce him to you as our keynote speaker for today. Uh, and he will speak on the question of the Africa uh, CDC's Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative in the context of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, pathogen-based uh, uh, pandemic. And um, he wants to talk to us about the biosecurity and biosafety aspects of that. So over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wilmot, uh, for that uh, warm introduction. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening, uh, depending on where you are as you are joining us today. Uh, first of all, allow me to appreciate the organizers of this symposium and thank them for inviting the Africa CDC, uh, Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC, to participate in this meeting. On behalf of our director, Dr. John Kenkerson, who is also a participant has already been mentioned in this symposium. I thank you all. Secondly, let me appreciate um, and recognize the Director General of WHO, Dr. Tedros, uh, for his message. Uh, also uh, recognize and appreciate uh, Dr. Deprit of Columbia University, who is part of uh, this session. And also our moderator, Dr. Umo James, who has just made the introductions. My fellow panelists uh, that you can see on your screens as well as all the participants that are tuned uh, at this moment. My keynote address today will speak uh, to the theme of our pre-meeting uh, on biosafety and biosecurity, and specifically on the most spoken about subject of these days, uh, which is the SARS-CoV-2. I will also set the stage for my fellow panelists, who after me will speak about, um, and I'll speak about the Africa CDC Regional Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative, in the context of this pandemic, looking at how this initiative would ensure protection of our frontline workers, protection of the public at large, as well as the environment, not only during this pandemic, but how this initiative going forward will also uh, protect um, uh, our frontline workers, our communities, as well as the environment in future epidemics, as well as other events uh, that are of uh, public health concern. As a bit of background, the Africa CDC Regional Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative was launched by the Africa Union together with the Africa CDC and its regional and global partners, including the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Global Affairs, uh, Canada's Weapons Threat Reduction Program, the United States uh, Center, Center for Disease Control, the United States Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and many other uh, collaborators in 20. Uh, 19. Uh, this being a novel virus, we are all, uh, we're all and are actually currently experiencing the SARS-CoV-2 virus for the very first time. When the virus hit the shores of Africa on the 14th of February 2020 in Egypt, there were more unknowns and there were a lot more questions, but with very limited knowledge available to answer them. As we are all aware, the virus even changed its name, of course, um, uh, as the pandemic uh, continued. This is a sign of how little we knew about it at that time. This knowledge gap spared researchers into action in a bid to answer many questions on what type of virus we're dealing with, what is its origins, what is its genetic makeup, how is it transmitted, and how it can actually be treated. And as we progressed and began to realize that this was not a pandemic that was passing by, questions about vaccines started to emerge, as we heard uh, from the WHO uh, Director General. All these key issues pointed towards the strong need for research to help us uh, effectively respond to this pandemic. 
In other words, the ongoing research has to a large extent been very beneficial in terms of informing our response strategies and our interventions. It has been research that has been put to good use. Uh, in other words, research that has been put to good use um, is research that has been put to good use is research that is beneficial. Research that is conducted responsibly by all those that are involved. Research that is conducted in a safe manner that ensures the biosafety and biosecurity concerns are addressed. And by doing so, it is then research that contributes to the overall evidence informing policy making for our policy makers for them to be able to make decisions that will help us to respond effectively. You have heard from the Director General that one of the issues that is required is for us to have, for the, for the communities to have confidence in us. Therefore, research that is also put to good use is the research that contributes to that building of trust and confidence in our science and in our research. As we stand today, the ongoing research has been able to inform us in terms of what this virus is, its transmissibility, and it has also answered and continue to answer many questions on treatment and vaccines. All these have helped us in decision making as far as the public health measures and interventions uh, that have been implemented by countries, including the imposition, as well as now the easing of lockdowns and other measures um, that are concerned. The ongoing research uh, at Africa CDC, we also have dedicated resources um, uh, and areas where we also contribute to the overall generating of information as well as its distribution and dissemination to the member states so that they can be able to make informed decision. As part of that, on our Africa CDC website, we have dedicated areas where you can be able to look at the latest research and information in as far as COVID-19 is concerned. We have our COVID-19 research tracker that provide all the public health related research and issues as they are coming. We also have um, in Africa CDC science and health policy brief where decisions that are being made at the regional level are developed uh, as they are developed and uh, based on the uh, most updated research and information that is available. However, all this research and information we've been getting, it's all well and good. But sometimes in life, things are not as always a straight line as we'd wish them to be. It's not always that all research actually ends up with positive results or the positive impact that we want it to be. That is the positive gains that we gain out of the research. Sometimes the research that is intended to benefit us, that is intended to inform policy, may in the same process have results that might easily be misapplied, leading to harm, either intentionally or unintentionally. From this, we take a leaf from the 2011 research that was conducted on the genetic, bas uh, genetic basis of transmissibility of the H5N1 virus, which in the process resulted in the creation of a laboratory modified H5N1 virus. At that time, concerns were then raised on how these genetically modified viruses will be managed and how the information on how they can be generated, how they can be transmitted, should be disseminated. This then created a scenario called dual use of research, where in life science research, research that is intended for the benefit uh, of, of our communities, informing us to respond, will or may also have results that might easily be mis misapplied, leading to cause of harm. Therefore, this research that potentially have a benefit to us, which we call uh, gain of function, but at the same time have a potential to enhance the pathogenicity and transmissibility of some of these potential some of these agents that have a potential to cause pandemic then raise biosafety and biosecurity questions and concerns in terms of how are these going to be managed, how is the information going to be disseminated, and how some of these um, uh, pathogens or agents that are then created or modified are going to be managed. Now, with these biosafety and biosecurity concerns for the ongoing research and that uh, which may come going forward. How then is the level of capacity or preparedness of our systems here in Africa when it comes to biosafety and biosecurity? 
Unfortunately, the WHO joined external evaluations that were conducted between 2016 and 2019 among the African member states, did not paint a very good picture. Biosafety and biosecurity is one of the weakest among the 19 core capacities that are assessed during the joint external evaluation. When you look at the slide to your far left, it shows that on average, if you average the performance of the member states that were evaluated during this period, their average performance is well below 50% at 32%, with minimum lowest scores going as low as 20 and um, only going high, as high as 60. This then shows you the level of capacity when it comes to biosafety and biosecurity and our preparedness to handle other eventualities, including maybe an intentional release of some uh, of these agents that are of high consequence. You will hear more from my, some of uh, the panelists that are on this discussion as they give you more details on how the region is prepared in terms of facing some of these biosecurity and biosecurity concerns. It is now with this background that the Africa CDC, in collaboration with its regional and international partners, launched the Regional Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative. This initiative is meant to strengthen the biosecurity and biosecurity systems of our African member states in order that they can be assisted and capacitated to comply with some of the international regulations, including the International Health Regulations, the IHR of 2005, Biological Weapons Conventions, other uh, treaties that we have signed to, including the United Nations Security Council, as well as the Global Health Security Agenda Action Packages, especially the Action Package on Prevention number three that speaks to uh, biosafety and biosecurity. Now, this initiative is looking at both strengthening both sides of this problem, that is the biosecurity as well as the biosecurity concept. When you look from the biosecurity aspects, we are looking to assist our member states and strengthen their capacity to have effective containment uh, principles, technologies as well as practices that are implemented in our countries. In other words, we are looking at uh, facilities where some of these agencies and research are taking place. Do they meet the international or global standards? or requirements, some of the technologies and practices, including infection prevention and control, personal protective equipment, are these available and are these being used effectively? As well as looking at the legislation around how these can be effected and um, implemented in the countries to ensure that our frontline health workers, our communities, as well as the environment is protected from some of these and, and international exposure to this biological agent and sometimes the threat of extend down their extend down release. We will also look at uh, the initiative, we will also look at the biosecurity aspects. And here it is looking to strengthening member states' capacity to ensure that there is protection, they have the means to control and ensure that there is accountability for some of these valuable biological materials that are being kept in some of these high level containment facilities and laboratories in order that they can be able to uh, prevent their unauthorized access, lost thefts, and as we are talking about misuse and diversion for other um, international or international uh, intentional release um, um, uh, for, for these agents. Therefore, this initiative is looking to make sure or assist our member states, help them build the required structures, the required um, um, legislative frameworks to ensure that there is implementation of these biosafety and biosecurity measures. In the initiative, there are three areas that I would like to discuss today as they relate to the subject uh, for today. Under this initiative, there are three key outcomes that will contribute to the strengthening of biosaf biosafety and biosecurity with respect to uh, ensuring that member states are capacitated in the protection for our frontline workers, our communities, as well as our uh, environment against uh, some of these uh, harmful pathogens. Firstly, through a consultative process uh, of our member states, our 54 member states, the Africa CDC is looking to develop a model legal framework for biosafety and biosecurity. It will also support member states to develop and implement a certification framework for institutions that are handling some of these high consequence pathogens and toxins 
and um, thirdly, to help member states create a consensus list of high consequence agents and toxins. Now, looking much more closely at what are we looking at in terms of biosafety, the legal uh, framework for biosafety and biosecurity. In the consultations that have already been conducted among member states, it has become very evident that lack of legally binding pronouncements at country level is one of the key obstacles for ensuring enforcement of many of the regulatory requirements that either already exist, exist or those that are meant um, to be implemented. Therefore, working together with all our international partners, as well as member states, we will develop a model framework for adoption into country-specific legislation, uh, which could either be existing and lacking some areas which will strengthen, and if not existing, member states can then adopt this uh, model framework uh, and implement them in their countries such that they can be supported in the implementation of national biosafety and the biosecurity programs. We're also looking to ensure that this legal framework will allow for the establishment of a government, government agency to administer and enforce some of these biosecurity and biosecurity uh, initiatives that are being implemented. Where they exist and the, the framework will ensure that one uh, is put in place and where they exist, it will empower or mandate these existing agents to have oversight in terms of implementation of some of these biosecurity and biosafety uh, initiatives. If, uh, alongside that, we will also create uh, a mechanism for accountability through the framework in terms of the production, the use, the storage, or transportation of some of these high-risk pathogens. In other words, this legal framework will detect or give guidance or policies in terms of how these pathogens can be accounted for, how what is their use, as well as storage and transportation uh, as they are moved from one place to the other. In the framework as well, it will define the physical protection me measures for our frontline workers, those that are involved in handling these pathogens, how our communities can be protected in terms of unintentional release or accidental release, as well as um, the, the environment in which some of these pathogens are, or high containment facilities do exist. Looking at the second aspect, which is the certification, creating a certification framework for institutions that are high handling some of these high consequence pathogens. A number of our member states do have, and some are planning to establish high level institutions that handle these high consequence pathogens and toxins. However, there is currently no system for ensuring that these institutions meet the international requirements and standards for biosafety and biosecurity. Therefore, through this initiative, we will establish a review mechanism that will provide recog uh, regional recognition in a stepwise way of these institutions that are um, keeping and containing these high consequence pathogens. And we intend to use a peer-to-peer -peer systems where member states will evaluate each other and then uh, ensure that there's re regional recognition in, in these institutions in terms of meeting the required standards. We do have experience of implementing a similar system in the Africa region where uh, working with WHO, we implemented um, a, a stepwise process of moving our uh, level two laboratories towards international ISO accreditation and certification. Using a similar way, we will also implement likewise for uh, these institutions that are handling high consequence pathogens. Alongside that, we will also uh, ensure that there's creation of benchmarks as well as regional standards for biosafety and biosecurity that are based on international requirements, requirements for which these institutions are required to comply. Based on these benchmarks and regional standards, the uh, framework for review uh, and assessment will then peer-to-peer -peer assessment will then be created for the recognition uh, through the established uh, framework. To make sure also that um, there is information ex uh, exchange and sharing as well as ensuring that there's no duplication of efforts in our regional uh, institutions and facilities. We will also set up a community of practice for these high level containment institutions in the Africa regions to ensure that there's discussion, sharing of science, sharing of information, uh, which can be uh, bilateral between countries or multilateral uh, collaboration with other uh, high containment facilities that are beyond the Africa region. And of course, to ensure that these facilities are able or have the capacity to comply to the regional standards that will have been developed and be able to move in a stepwise alongside the recognition process, 
We will also develop alongside and implement a training and capacity building program to support this compliance for these high containment uh, facilities. Then thirdly and lastly, we will also, uh, to, um, um, as part of uh, strengthening um, our member states in this initiative, work uh, collaboratively with them to create a consensus list of these high consequence agents and toxins. One way of ensuring proper management of these pathogens that potentially can cause harm and potentially can cause epidemics is to create a consensus list of high consequence agents and toxins. Through this initiative, the Africa CDC um, uh, working collaboratively with member states and our international partners who assist member states and agree on a list of these agents and toxins. And there are several benefits um, um, of having such a list as has been done in other, in other regions. First of all, it allows member states to identify which agents and toxins are of high priority and how these can be controlled in terms of their possession, in terms of their use, and how these can be moved from one place to the other if there's need. And sometimes there's move exportation even to other countries, given that in our Africa region, we may not have capacity for some of the research that may be required. So some of these ag agents may need to move from the continent. And once they are identified on the list, there are then guidelines that are put in place, procedures that are put in place that ensure that they are then controlled in a certain way that, is, uh, that ensures that there is safety for all those that are involved, including our communities as well as our environment. And there are several considerations, like has been done in other regions. When we are coming with this consensus list, we have already started doing our initial consultations and some of the issues that have been brought out by the member states is that we need to consider the ability to genetically manipulate this organism so that it can make it to the list, whether there's a vaccine that, is, um, uh, it, um, that can be administered at the population level, is it available, is there history of uh, prior misuse, it's sort of impact it can have on the economy. We have seen how the SARS-CoV-2 has impacted us uh, in the last uh, eight months. It's availability, whether these agents are found in the environment, are they in the laboratory, or are natural reserves. These will be the considerations as we finalize this consensus list for um, the agents and the toxins that will make it to the, to the list. Now, how are we planning to have this implemented in a structured and coordinated way? As Africa CDC, uh, um, as mentioned by um, Dr. Wimot at the beginning of this session, our structure is such that we have five regional collaborating centers that are based in the central, east, north, south, and western part uh, of our Africa, Africa region. Therefore, we are setting up standing structures, which we are calling the regional biosafety and biosecurity technical working groups that are multi-sectorial, multidisciplinary, and um, these will be responsible for implementing and driving these, some of the activities that I've mentioned of the initiative through the member states that fall under, this, under that region. For example, if you look at the regional biosafety and biosecurity technical working group for Central Africa, it will then have members that are coming from Burundi, Cameroon, Chad, Congo, and so forth as they are listed there. These then uh, will be meeting on a regular basis, discussing the initiatives. They will be responsible for monitoring the implementation of the initiatives and ensuring there's adoption of some of um, um, the, the policies and guidelines and standard operating procedures that are developed at regional level and adopted at country level. Over and above these five regional technical working groups, we will have a continental-wide bus safety and bus security working group which will then have representation, representation from each of the five regional biosecurity and biosecurity technical working group. This structure really falls in line with the consultative process and steps that are required by Africa Union when you are developing consensus among the member states uh, in our region. Now, uh, as my last slide, and as I conclude, what then are we saying as Africa CDC going forward when it comes to the issue under uh, discussion today, which is the dual use of research consent. What we are saying is really in line with what the WHO has already uh, indicated when they held their consensus meeting sometime uh, back uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, where after the 2011 uh, issue of H1, um, H1N5 um, came about, there were issues and concerns that were raised. They came up with some agreements in terms of how should we proceed going forward in managing 
uh, dual research uh, concern. There are five areas that they really highlight. One of these is that there is need to have research oversight mechanisms. Uh, these are mechanisms that are at global, continental, regional, and country level to make sure that there's oversight in terms of the type of research uh, that is being conducted within the member state. However, these research oversight mechanisms need to balance between the security concerns as well as the need for continued research. In other words, we need to make sure that we are secure and also need to make sure that research continues so that it informs us of decisions that, are, that need to be made. Because of that reason, these mechanisms need to be continually reviewed for their effectiveness and the impact, sort of impact they are having on the research. They also raise the issue which we are in agreement in terms of need to have policies for pending funding agencies. They are, in other words, funding should not necessarily influence the direction in which uh, some of this research and their dissemination should, should proceed. Policies should be in place to make sure that we guard against this, uh, the safety of our frontline workers, our communities, as well as um, the environment. Also looking at um, international and national regulations, including the IHRA and those that I've mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. We need also to make sure that our countries and our member states are capacitated. And this is what we are trying to do through the um, Africa CDC Regional Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative so that they can then be able to comply to these national and international regulations uh, as they are specified and they've attested and signed to. And of course, we could all have research mechanism systems, we could have policies, we could have regulations, but it really comes down to institutions and prof professional codes of conduct in their ethics, how they uh, conduct research wherever they are and be able to uh, uh, share whatever that they're doing in order that it can be tested and checked whether it meets uh, some of the uh, requirements. And of course, there's need to raise awareness and education among a wide range of audiences so that people can be aware, our communities can be aware, our health workers can be aware as to what is allowed and what is not allowed uh, and uh, how their safety is being guaranteed uh, throughout the conduct of this research. With this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you uh, and I will hand over back uh, to Dr. Wilmot uh, for the continuation of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to uh, Dr. Maruta for a really remarkable walk through uh, what the gaps are in Africa and what the challenges are and how the Africa Center for Disease Control uh, plans to uh, plug the gaps with interventions on legal uh, capacity building and other uh, uh, mechanisms to upgrade both uh, the education and training and the ability of the continent on a physical a human and technological level to meet the challenge of biosecurity challenges. You heard him uh, mention a statistic of 32% achievement rate uh, for Africa member states on average. That's an average figure. If you deep dive deeper into the actual numbers, uh, both uh, if you look at the WHO's joint external evaluation figures, uh, as well as the global health security index figures that were released at the end of last year, uh, there's a lot of detail about where precisely the gaps are. So we have a very good nuanced understanding uh, of, of what the issues are, what the gaps are, and then developing programs. And the program, as you've heard, uh, elaborated by Dr. Maruta, is an ambitious one covering 54 states in Africa uh, across the continent with great variation. So it's quite a remarkable achievement. And as you can hear from uh, uh, it's a quite a remarkable effort we are, have to undertake. We've just really started uh, that process and we're building the blocks uh, uh, for, for a better system. And Dr. Maruta um, is uh, leading at the effort. So thank you very much for that. Uh, let me say, um, as you know, that in the end, there's this concept called sovereignty. And so you can have, uh, you can have global frameworks like we have with the international health regulations. Um, you can have continental frameworks as we're setting up with the Africa CDC, but in the end, uh, what matters is what nation states do or what countries do if they're not nation states. Uh, it's the actions they take, it is the budgets they pass, it's the policies they pursue, and it's the accountability framework and implementation that they actually enhance. African countries have been remarkably participative in this entire process, and so we're very, very optimistic that we can get there. 
uh, and get in the end actions on a nation state level. In the end, you have to put money behind your priorities and we, we're gonna work on this issue. Um, and so it's in the end, the call is to countries to begin to um, do what's necessary. Uh, before we discuss that issue, I wanna to turn to our, uh, our next speaker, Andrew Hevelar, because what we'd like to do now is just do a deep dive into the science and technological risks that the world faces. Uh, and, uh, and Andrew will uh, respond to Dr. Maruta and just spend uh, some minutes dealing with what the actual current risks are and what the emerging risks are uh, in biosecurity and biosafety from a science and biotechnology perspective. Uh, Andrew is uh, the senior director of uh, and lead scientist uh, for global biological policy and programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. He has a very strong academic background in microbiology and related subjects, uh, holding a PhD. He has uh, the very, very distinguished uh, bio. Um, but let me just mention that he's, uh, in his previous capacity, he worked uh, in the Office of Science and Technology Policy for the Obama administration. Over to you, Andrew. Great, thank you so much for such a, a kind introduction, Wilmot. Uh, and let me just start at the beginning by telling you how happy I am to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I just wanna quickly thank the organizers, both Columbia University and the University of Witwatersrand, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Tom uh, Dupree, you, Wilmot, for organizing such a great session. Um, the fantastic keynote we just heard from Dr. Maruda, as well as all of my fellow panelists. So um, as you mentioned, what I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time um, focused on is really some of the emerging uh, risks uh, from a biotechnology perspective. Um, where I wanted to begin is what we're, the world is consumed by right now, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously the COVID-19 pandemic illustrates the grave threat that catastrophic biological events pose uh, to global health, to our stability, and to our economic security. And it has also shown us just how inadequately the world is prepared. Um, in our highly interconnected world, biological threats are only increasing. The next pandemic could emerge at any time and may not arise naturally like COVID-19, but could instead result from a laboratory accident or uh, from deliberate misuse. We've known for years that the world is unprepared for a pandemic event. While some progress has been made, to identify gaps following specifically the 2014 Ebola epidemic in West Africa. There has been no systematic global effort to sustain financing and to fill those pandemic gaps. In 2019, my organization, the Nuclear Threat Initiative or NTI, um, partnered with John Hopkins Center for Health Security and with the Economist Intelligence Unit to develop uh, the Global Health Security Index. This index is really the first comprehensive, fully open, objective, and fully transparent assessment of global health security capabilities uh, and is, details those capabilities uh, in more than 195 countries. The index aims to illuminate preparedness and capacity gaps to increase both political will and financing to fill gaps at both the national and international levels. The index found that the average preparedness score for a country is just 40.2 out of 100. And for deliberate events, it's even much worse with the average being only 16 out of 100. Um, our index covers a range of different uh, indicators. Uh, and what I wanted to show you just very briefly was how Africa is doing um, on uh, indicators related to the topic of today's discussion. Uh, which is really uh, focused on biosafety, biosecurity, and dual use uh, research of concern. So in the first plot here, you can see how Africa is doing uh, on biosecurity, where the average score for biosecurity capacities was 7.88. Um, for biosafety, you can see a little bit of progress in that the, uh, there are more countries that are doing better on biosafety, but obviously there's still a long way to go. Um, and on dual use research, um, basically no countries right now in Africa uh, have dual use national uh, policies mandated for dual use research oversight. If 
But Africa is not alone in being, uh, having opportunities to strengthen each of these important areas. Uh, the risk landscape around the world is changing. Recent advances in biotechnology have made it easier, cheaper, and faster to make and modify pandemic agents that could pose an even greater threat to humanity. At the same time, bioscience capacity in Africa is increasing, and we're seeing bioscience uh, innovation uh, really uh, increasing across the entire African continent. We're seeing growing international partnerships between Africa and other countries on bioscience. For example, in my country, the United States, the US National Institutes of Health recently announced a $58 million initiative in Africa uh, aimed at advancing data science, uh, catalyzing innovation, and spurring health discoveries. We're also seeing uh, other indicators that the life science capacity in Africa is increasing. And one of the easiest ways to look at this is just through scientific publications or scientific output. Um, we've seen a really a dramatic increase from 1996 to 2012 in the number of research papers published in scientific journals with at least one African author, um, with that, those publications more than quadrupling over that time frame. Um, but it is, it is more evident now than ever before that we must work together to reduce the risks that these advances in bioscience and biotechnology might pose so that we can increase and protect the ability of biotechnology uh, to really address our most urgent health and development challenges. But what can be done to catalyze change? First, we should plan for a future where it's possible to advance new biotechnologies while simultaneously investing uh, to reduce their risks. Technology and scientific advances within the life sciences are outpacing effective gov governmental oversight mechanisms, forcing the technical community to govern itself and creating an uneven patchwork of security and safety practices across facilities, countries, and regions. These gaps require multi-sectoral engagement due to the cross-cutting nature of these threats, and we need new forms of collaboration uh, across sectors. So among governments, uh, civil society, and industry. Um, my organization has launched an initiative that we call the Biosecurity Innovation and Risk Reduction Initiative um, that's really aimed at advancing safer and more secure pursuit of biotechnology innovation um, to benefit society. This initiative is working to catalyze new incentives for researchers, for funders, for technology investors, publishers, insurance, and other stakeholders to identify and reduce biological risks associated with advances in technology. Uh, working in partnership with global leaders, uh, the initiative members are now piloting new approaches to improve global biosecurity, enhance governance for new biological tools and technologies, and reduce the potential for deliberate or accidental misuse that could result in a high consequence or a catastrophic biological event. Today, I wanted to discuss just three concrete steps um, that we're taking to establish global biosecu biosecurity norms and standards uh, and promoting best practices in the development of policies and guidance among national governments that my organization is spearheading. First, I wanted to tell you about our work to create a mechanism to screen the products of DNA synthesis, obviously an important area in sy synthetic biology. Um, in 2020, uh, NTI and the World Economic Forum organized an international technical consortium on DNA synthesis screening and launched an effort to develop an international common mechanism uh, to screen DNA synthesis products. This consortium had expertise and representation from Africa, uh, including the Nigeria CDC. In 2002, scientists, uh, as this audience is obviously aware, have demonstrated the, the de novo synthesis of a full viral genome. And since then, DNA synthesis technology is capable uh, of printing pathogen or, or toxin DNA have become widely available via a relatively small number of companies and other DNA providers. At the same time, synthesized DNA has become a staple of life sciences research and biotech development. And this DNA availability has become critical for technological and economic advances. As access expands and the cost of DNA synthesis declines, more DNA will be in commerce and additional DNA providers may enter the market, further expanding the range of people using synthetic DNA. 
A critical and challenging first step in this process is generating consensus around the specifications for an international uh, screening mechanism, including the types of DNA sequences that should be flagged by the mechanism as potentially harmful. Although many DNA providers practice screening procedures to help prevent the misuse of synthetic DNA, these practices are becoming increasingly expensive relative to other business costs, thus increasing economic pressure uh, to limit such procedures. Many of these providers have expressed a desire for shared assurance of reliable screening across the industry. In addition, in the next two or three years, there will be a new generation of benchtop DNA synthesis machines enabled by enzymatic DNA synthesis methods, and those will become available without guidance or norms to prevent misuse. Within a decade, these machines could significantly ex expand the availability of synthetic DNA around the world, and it's in this context that we are increasingly, it is becoming increasingly critical to safeguard against the misuse of DNA synthesis technologies to make pathogen or toxin DNA. A second effort is to develop a seal of approval for researchers and practitioners who adhere to international peer-based biosecurity standards for life science researchers. There are currently no international peer-based standards to determine which facilities have practices to reduce and manage risks associated with dual-use research. Similarly, there are curr currently no international peer-based standards or incentives for researchers, funders, publishers, and investors to manage the emerging risks associated with advances in life science and biomedicine. Biosecurity standards are especially important for emerging tech that may en enable dual-use research of concern. And therefore, an international standardized seal of approval might incentivize additional investments in biosecurity where there have not yet been large investments in biotech. As technology investments grow around the world as they are in Africa, technical and policy leaders can work together with national public health institutes to incentivize standards to reduce the risk of deliberate or accidental misuse. A pilot project here involving Columbia University in New York, and the National Institute of Communicable Diseases in Johannesburg uh, is now underway. And finally, I wanted to uh, tell you just a little bit about an initiative that we call the Visibility Initiative for Responsible Science, which is seeking to improve the performance and recording of risk benefit assessments throughout the research life cycle to include study design, funding, peer review, and publication. This initiative works to improve the performance and recording of risk benefit assessments before, during, and at the time of publication of biological research. Currently, there is no consistent method for researchers, their institutions, funders, or publishers to assess and manage biosecurity risks. And even when such an assessment is made, it's not necessarily documented or shared with other participants in the research lifecycle. Existing assessments and management plans often do not include risks for emerging technologies that could potentially enable dual use research of concern and research funders, publishers should play a role in evaluating proposals and manuscript sub 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 submissions to catch and mitigate or eliminate risks early. Government research funders should consider improving biosecurity risk assessment and mitigation for the life sciences, and in particular, those involving emerging technologies. So in closing, um, the projects that I've uh, mentioned recognize that research and development in genomics, Synthetic biology and microbiology are essential to advance health security, food security, environmental security, and other components essential to health and sustainable development. However, both well-established and emerging biotechnologies have the potential to enable research that could lead to accidental or deliberate misuse of a harmful biological agent. COVID-19 has shown our extreme lack of global preparedness and shed light on the importance of national and international leadership and unified approaches. And it's critical that we work now and into the future to prevent the next pandemic, whether naturally occurring, the result of a laboratory accident, or worse, uh, the result of deliberate misuse. Uh, again, many thanks for the opportunity to speak to you here today, and I look forward uh, to the discussion. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Andrew, for uh, spending 10 minutes walking us through very complicated and complex issues. Uh, colleagues, as you've heard, um, the question of um, 
innovations mm. and emerging risks in biotech and modern biological science in particular is a very fast moving target. Uh, and so there has to be a swift response to how one uh, conducts oversight. We, we don't want to choke research, it's very important uh, to create the space for it. At the same time, we need oversight mechanisms um, to make sure that there's good practice. Um, and so uh, it's the kind of thing where if you manage this process, nobody would know about it because there's no consequence. But if you don't manage this process, a catastrophe emerges. Um, and so we're very grateful that uh, a fraternity of interested parties are focusing on this particular question about how to keep dangerous pathogens, whether they're natural or whether they're synthetic, in very, very, very safe hands. Uh, we've seen what happened with COVID with SARS-CoV-2. It's a natural outbreak. And you can see what happens uh, in terms of the consequences when you have a high level of transmissibility uh, and a contagiousness that, uh, that we are trying to confront. Um, and if, it, if that happens, it's also possible that a synthetically, uh, genetically uh, modified organism or um, one that uh, is synthetically produced can have consequences that are more catastrophic. And so this is really important work. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew for doing that. So we were now going to turn to um, a colleague from Kenya who is a very senior health official uh, in the Kenyan ministry uh, and she has been caught up in the parliamentary process and as a former South African member of parliament I know what it's like to be caught in a parliamentary process that is not in your control. So um, so Isabella Ayahas uh, was in the situation and said she will join us if she can. So I just need to check whether she has in fact joined us. If not, I can ask Carlo. Hi, Dr. James. She has not been able to join us yet. Okay. So uh, when she joins us, um, I'll slot her into the queue, as it were. Uh, if I can now turn, uh, therefore, to uh, Dr. Iqbal Parker, uh, who is uh, with us from Cape Town, which is my hometown, and I just wanted to say that I miss Cape Town very much. And what COVID-19 has done is isolated us in ways that, uh, uh, that is really quite unfortunate, but that's the way of the world uh, today. Uh, I, I'm also, my daughter Gabby is online as well, attending, or she's also based in Cape Town, so I just wanted to also just greet her through this means. Uh, so, so, uh, so Iqbal, uh, welcome. Iqbal is, uh, an Emeritus Professor of Medical Biochemistry and Structural Biology uh, at the University of Cape Town. He has a number of um, uh, uh, achievements uh, in his career. I just wanted to point out that he's a fellow of the Academy of Science uh, of South Africa, ASA, and he currently chairs the Biosafety and Biosecurity Committee for ASA. And he was the lead person in authoring um, a state-of-the-art report uh, on that subject. Uh, we asked uh, in these reflections, we asked Iqbal to, um, to uh, talk about the current and emerging biosecurity and biosafety risks uh, in Southern Africa uh, and any other issues that he thinks are pertinent in response to uh, Dr. Maruta's address. Over to you, Iqbal. I need to, and, yeah, I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon or good morning, morning to everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, I, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this, to this interesting uh, symposium. And uh, essentially what I'm going to do is, is give an overview of the study we've done on biosafety and biosecurity in, in Southern Africa. And then from there lead on to some of the issues that um, ar may arise um, uh, in terms of the COVID outbreak. Um, so what I'm going to do is to share my screen and um, um, this is just to, uh, to make you a little bit homesick. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is where I am. I'm, I'm currently in um, uh, in uh, based in Cape Town, and I'm sitting 
in my office somewhere to, over there. And uh, so what, what I'm going to do is talk about what the Academy of Science of South Africa has done uh, in terms of biosafety and biosecurity in Southern Africa. We convened a first meeting in March 2018, um, getting together people from the various SADC countries um, to get in a, to assess the state of biosafety and biosecurity. And uh, fortunately, we had all the SADC countries present at that meeting. And that was followed by a second meeting in uh, November 2019. And uh, we, we in the process of compiling the final report on this meeting. But essentially, what came out of this meeting in terms of the regulatory framework and the legislation related to biosafety and biosecurity in the SATC using the WHO JEE evaluation um, was that there was a lack of uh, or inadequate uh, legislation and regulations and guidelines relating to biosecurity especially. Uh, although there were some regulations on biosafety, there, there was very little in terms of biosecurity. And where they did exist, they were very fragmented. Um, so they were fragmented across different depo government departments and there wasn't a single entity talking to biosafety or biosecurity uh, as a whole. Um, the second uh, uh, problem was the limited or the lack of capacity in terms of infrastructure, in terms of resources and human capacity, um, especially personnel and facilities with respect to mon monitoring, quarantine and inspection of facilities of items that are either imported or exported from the country. Um, thirdly, there was a severe lack of or limited training programs for people in biosafety and biosecurity. And, and that was already sort of hinted in, uh, by Andrew in his presentation. Um, there were generally low levels of awareness of biosafety and biosecurity in amongst researchers and scientists. There was a focus on biosafety in terms of personal safety and laboratory safety, um, but very little awareness on biosecurity um, uh, amongst them. And, and this was borne out by the challenges in the second Ebola outbreak in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2018-2019. Um, as shown up by some of the JEE findings of the region. Um, the, in terms of regulatory framework and regulation, uh, some countries have uh, robust um, regulatory frameworks in place. South Africa, for example, has a regulatory framework around bioweapons and biotoxin production, etc. But many other countries um, do not have any of these regulations. Uh, and some have started looking at it, but nothing concrete in place yet. Um, and then there were significant limitations and challenges um, in terms of implementing, monitoring, and ensuring effective regulation without impeding research. Um, and the, these were all identified in uh, surveys to people and in these countries. And then again, uh, I think Tokmo has also mentioned this, the absence of a com comprehensive list of all infectious agents that pose or may pose a threat to public health, be it from accidental or deliberate use. Um, in South Africa, for example, the Department of Health have their own list. The Department of Agriculture has its own list, um, but the two lists that don't talk to each other. So if you want to find a comprehensive list, you have to visit 
many departments and very often it's not easy to find on their websites either. And so um, some of the aspects of implementation of biosafety and biosecurity practices in academic or research institutions um, were identified under three main topics. The one is ethics. Um, Although there are very good training programs and education around basic ethics um, research, um, the issues around biosecurity, dual use, misconduct, etc., are not very routine. The ethics training focuses on human ethics, animal ethics, but not the extend, extended aspects of um, uh, dual use, biosecurity, etc. And science policy, uh, in these countries, there's also very poor communication between policymakers and scientists. But I guess that's not only in Africa, it's probably all countries that it's true. And so there's an overall lack of knowledge and training in terms of national and international laws relevant to life sciences. And I stress the international laws because we're talking about moving samples from one country to another as well. And um, in terms of biosafety and biosecurity, the life scientists generally are very confident about the knowledge in terms of regulatory frameworks regarding laboratory safety. But they are less confident and sometimes even indifferent uh, to requirements in terms of dual use or biosecurity. To, to many scientists, dual use is a foreign concept, a foreign word, uh, not present in the vocabulary. Um, so these were some of the problems and challenges um, that we face. And, and in terms of the COVID outbreak, in terms of biosafety and biosecurity, um, obviously regulations focused on biosafety, on physical distancing, on wearing masks, on sanitizing, etc. And there's been uh, little or no progress on looking at deliberate versus natural events versus accidental release. I guess it's too early um, to do this yet, but it's never too early to start thinking about it, about what could happen in future. And, uh, and also disease outbreak response, um, should there be a second and a third and a fourth wave, um, sorry, we've already seen second, but third and fourth waves, how does one manage those uh, um, responses? And also modified strains, whether they are genetically modified or mutations of, or naturally occurring modified strains how does one handle that, what, what procedures are in place, etc. So these are all things that we need to start thinking about. And one of the big problems um, that we faced as, as health scientists in educating the public, um, and probably not, this is not the Africa specific problem, but all over, it's uh, the emergence of fake news, uh, fake remedies that you take, there were studies, not studies, but claims that you need to take 100 milligrams of vitamin C a day to keep COVID away and on all sorts of things. And it was amazing how rapidly these items spread on the social media networks um, that people used to phone and say, look, I saw this, is it working? Can I try this? Um, so uh, uh, we cannot underestimate the use of social media in, in the risk um, to society in, in terms of the news that it spreads. Um, social media, also various conspiracy theories um, arose uh, or were circulated in, in social media. There were claims that it's not a virus, it's a bacterium and that you can treat it with antibiotics. And these are just some of the things that that came up that we need to look at in terms of public awareness and how we deal with public in, the, in these risks. And obviously one of the major things is politicization of the whole process. Um, again, this was 
and the international phenomenon, probably not so much in Africa as in some of the other countries. Uh, but again, that's a problem uh, when politicians um, manipulate the system and advance their own ideas for their own political agendas. Um, so these are just some of the things that I thought I'll raise um, to, to add to the pot uh, when we get to discussing uh, further biosafety and biosecurity aspects. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to, uh, to, to Dr. Parker. Um, so as you've heard, he's, um, he's made uh, remarks about uh, what has been done uh, in Southern Africa, what the initiatives have been on the part of ASEP and the science community uh, to identify gaps, to define the interventions required, uh, and to really um, partake in what is a global problem. It's, it's really important to emphasize the whole question of oversight over DLUs uh, uh, and, and the biological uh, technology risks that are emerging is a new thing. And that very few countries, in fact, um, have solid systems to deal with it. So, um, um, and so it's a global challenge. Um, the fact is that in the developing world, it is a, in part, a monumental challenge, uh, but that challenge has been recognized. We know it's an issue and we know what needs to be done. And the question is how does one best tackle the, uh, the, the, the problems in a way where there's some traction. So, um, and, and if I'll end it off by speaking about the question of scientific misinformation that has arisen uh, with COVID-19, uh, it's always been there. Um, and the temptation to seek simple solutions, the temptation to believe in conspiracy theories has always been there, but it's magnified in a way by social media in this modern world that really just poses the issue about how to look for both the public understanding of science. How does one do that in this modern era when you have uncurated messages uh, through cell phones and so on? And how does one rebuild trust in science to solve real human challenging problems in the face of politicians who in fact undermine that whole process? So, um, so, so thank you very much for that, um, uh, Dr. Parker. Uh, that, is, uh, that was really fabulous. I'm going to check in again with Harlow if Isabella uh, has in fact joined us or not. Unfortunately, she has not yet joined us, so we should. Okay. Have All right. So if we can turn then to uh, Natasha Griffith. Um, uh, Natasha is the Associate Director of Operations, uh, um, responsible for high containment laboratories uh, at the Georgia State University. Uh, and in particular, she oversees a new research facility at BSL Core uh, and leads a multidisciplinary team to support uh, safe operations uh, of all high co containment facilities uh, at the university. She is formerly uh, from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and she is a principal partner uh, with me. Um, um, in terms of uh, being consultants to the Nuclear Threat Initiative uh, in the area of biological uh, policy and security. And together we work uh, with uh, Tokmo Maruta at the Africa Center for Disease Control uh, in running technical uh, training programs. Uh, so um, over to you, Natasha. Thank you, Wilmont, and uh, thank you. I would like to um, go ahead and thank organizers for inviting me to be part of this uh, exciting uh, seminar series. So um, I, again, I think this is very, very important and I'm glad that we are all together talking about this. Um, so as we know, the World Health Organization on March 11, 2020 has declared the novel coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak um, a global pandemic. As a result, there is a lot of laboratories, research, as well as diagnostic um, that are increasing their capacity, and that's been happening globally. Furthermore, many countries around the world, including the United States, uh, started fast tracking vaccine and treatment research using latest technologies and different tools 
often through some type of emergency use authorizations. Due to the increase, uh, due to this increased urgency and fast tracking efforts, there is a potential for misuse of the research as well as of the materials and technologies used that could also increase without the proper oversight. And some of the colle my colleagues that spoke earlier mentioned that as well. These are not new concerns. We have seen some of the biosafety and biosecurity issues arise during Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa in the past. I was involved in those efforts uh, in 2014 20, to 2016. These past outbreaks and the current COVID-19 pandemic have highlighted some of the biosecurity and biosafety gaps. And we have been working together and we continue to work together to address these gaps and provide sample and sustainable solutions uh, moving forward. Some of the issues that are identified and they were mentioned before as well is such as material oversight. Um, you know, a lot of times we had issues in, on the West Africa side uh, on, on sample over ownership and where do those samples go and who they belong to. We had some issues that included material transport or transfer. Uh, and somebody mentioned earlier import and export issues as well. Um, just to give you an example, we ran into issues during Ebola where all the capa diagnostic capacity was so overwhelmed doing testing for Ebola that we could not do uh, testing for malaria and some other diseases. So we had to send some of those samples over to different, um, to a different country altogether. And so some issues on how do we do this um, and how do we follow the transport and transfer regulations from international standpoint, but also national standpoint, uh, came up um, for discussion. We also talked about some of the materials possession and use, uh, which include storage and where is the safe place to store some of these materials um, long term as well as short term. We also discussed material disposal issues and how do we uh, ensure that those materials that have that are infectious are properly disposed and cannot be accessed just by anybody. Um, the, the big issue in all of this became education and training. What we realized is there was, um, and this was mentioned before, there was not uh, some standard way of uh, educating and training different groups on ethics when it comes to you know, research as well as diagnostic. Um, we had uh, issues on how to uh, train people on doing proper both by safety and by security risk assessment. And also what are the parameters about sharing some of these information and gaps that are identified when we do these by safety and by security risks. And so the need was highlighted also from the standpoint of use of the materials, not just in research and diagnostic, but also use of personal protective equipment. There were a lot of uh, things that were brought up that were shared, but there was no uh, training on how to properly use some of those materials, what materials can be replaced with other that are available in order to uh, ensure the continuity of the uh, diagnostic and research efforts. So some of those uh, things have been highlighted in the past and I have seen them reemerge as we look at the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, so Dr. Maruda mentioned in his talk that the implementation of the Africa CDC Regional Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative will ensure that an ongoing and future research for high-risk pathogens with pandemic potential such as current SARS-CoV-2 does not result in unintentional consequence of uh, misapplication of results or misuse of pathogenic agents leading to harm to the frontline workers or the communities and the environment as a whole. Education and training are really integral part of this effort. So partnering with Africa CDC, partnering with the regional collaborating centers, RCCs, to develop standardized approach to training 
um, adhering to international best practices is a crucial component in capacity building efforts. So establishment of the regional biosafety and biosecurity technical working groups, as Dr. Neruda mentioned in his talk, is a major step in the right direction for development of standardized policies, practices, and procedures for biosafety and biosecurity. This will ultimately increase capacity for response to outbreaks or pandemic events involving these high consequence pathogens across African continent and beyond. And as Dr. Maruda pointed out, will also ensure compliance with the international regulations, such as the International Health Regulation, the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, United, United Nations Security Council Resolution and others. And so I think it's really, really important um, and we all recognize it to um, join forces and uh, try to develop a standardized approach to education and training. So raising awareness, uh, educating people on, of, on risks um, that are potentially there uh, if we are not properly trained, but also on benefits of proper training and proper education, being able to provide people with resources and skills to be able to go ahead and um, use their knowledge in the right way and prevent some of the concerns we have run into with um, dual use uh, research of concern. So thank you very much and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Griffith, uh, Natasha, for, for that. Um, that uh, brings uh, the presentations in the session to an end. Uh, and it was a really excellent wrap, uh, uh, Natasha, in terms of uh, how the education and training uh, part of this um, effort to plug gaps in biosecurity and biosafety, how that is proceeding. And you are a key leader in that area. Uh, so thank you very much indeed uh, for that. So uh, I would like to encourage anybody who would like to pose a question to use the Q&A facility. Uh, to post this. There are two themes that have emerged from uh, some of the questions that have been asked, and I just wanted to um, uh, put those questions to our panelists. So one has to do with the general area of accountability. Uh, and, and this is to do with a tricky problem of um, having uh, global agreements and having global norms but where compliance with the of those norms are complicated by the complex relationship between national sovereignty and the regional and global um, bodies. So the prime example of that's international health regulations. It's, it's considered to be a global norm and it's considered to be a global law. Um, but if nation states don't comply, there are no real serious penalties. And so uh, adherence to those norms, compliance to those norms is largely a moral responsibility that countries exercise. And it's a response to peer pressure, obviously. The same in, uh, applies, with, uh, to, uh, applies to, uh, to uh, when it comes to biosecurity risks generally. The IHR clearly is relevant. That's an uh, international framework that specifies um, uh, how one deals with uh, with biosecurity risks as well, but there's also, as you've heard, the UN Security Council resolutions, uh, as well as the, uh, the Biological Weapons Convention and uh, items related to that. So the question that's being put uh, is, say in the case of Africa, uh, since we've spoken about the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is a division of the African Union, uh, and the African Union is a legitimate um, uh, uh, continental Union and has member states, uh, they do pay uh, and they operate through uh, the African Union's uh, uh, mechanisms. If there is uh, poor compliance, how, how does one exact uh, accountability uh, uh, from a nation state to, for example, the emerging normative framework when it comes to biosecurity? So that's an issue, it's a, it's a global issue. 
about how you get compliance, how you get adherence um, in the end. So I just wanted to turn to Dr. Maruta uh, to ask him to just address that question about how does one uh, promote adherence and how one promotes compliance. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that question. Uh, very important question, critical question. And uh, uh, it's, it's a big challenge, I think, compliance, not only to biosafety and biosecurity, but many of the uh, treaties and agreements that are agreed uh, by member states when it comes to compliance at uh, national level, it becomes a challenge. Um, so I think uh, to try and address that, one of the um, um, issues that we are making sure is to uh, the, the, the way we have designed the consultative process to ensure that uh, all 54 member states are consulted when it comes to especially the establishment of their um, biosafety and biosecurity legal framework. Uh, just, this just is a way of uh, trying to increase the buy-in at a political level. Uh, the structures that I had mentioned earlier on, which uh, Natasha also uh, quite highlighted, uh, processes that ensure that each of those member states is going to be involved in that process. And it then goes through the structures of the Africa Union, uh, the several technical committees, um, other um, establishments that include uh, politicians uh, and representatives from each of those countries until finally uh, the heads of states uh, when they endorse um, uh, the legal framework. So just as a way of uh, just trying to uh, increase the political buy-in at that level. But secondly, uh, this legal framework, uh, one of the things that uh, it wants to ensure that it exists is that in each of those member states, there is an agency uh, or an institution that is mandated by law uh, to ensure that there is enforcement uh, of uh, what is included in that uh, legal framework. From the initial consultations that have been done uh, to date, one of the issues raised by um, the, the, the technocrats within these member states is that uh, there is really no responsible agents within most of these countries that ensures oversight and then enforces and makes the government accountable, accountable to um, uh, things that they would have uh, agreed to. So as part of this uh, legal framework, uh, we are also ensuring that there is an agent that is identified in, or an institution, um, and then it is empowered legally by the, that legal document to enforce um, uh, some of the uh, requirements of the for biosafety and biosecurity, but uh, I would like to agree that uh, it's it's quite challenge. Uh, you know, so issue of sovereignty it, it becomes a, a big problem. In Africa Union, um, we cannot uh, come up with legal frameworks that are um, sort of uh, binding to that extent. Uh, member states will then have to adopt these and implement them within their legal structures so that uh, they can be um, uh, enforceable. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Maru. So, yeah, so domestica domestication of uh, continental laws and regulations is really quite important. Let me say this is a particularly, biosecurity is a particularly vexing issue. Um, and it's a particularly vexing issue because it crosses health, the environment, and defense. And they, as you know, it's a firewall between those two, between the hard departments and the soft departments, but clearly biodefense has to be part of this conversation. So I was gonna ask, uh, in fact, turn to you, Andrew, to ask you just what your reflections are. Uh, how about how one solves that problem of, uh, let's call it transversal government between soft departments and hard departments in your experience. Uh, we know in some countries that firewall is so firm you know, the communities don't speak the same language here. Um, and in other, in other experiences, it's a much looser, more creative. Uh, but clearly, you cannot have health act alone on this. It has to be together with, with defense, for example. Yeah, so thank you so much. And uh, you have put your finger on really one of the most important questions, Wilmot, because obviously the issue set that we're talking about here um, straddles many different domains. It's like biotechnology straddles science um, and it straddles security. And in order for us to have approaches that effectively um, address this set of risks, we need really strong active partnership across those very, very disparate communities. Um, you know, as I look back on my time um, sort of thinking about and navigating these issues, 
um, you know, it, it's important to remember that we've made progress, that, uh, you know, it, at the very outset of these issues, these, those communities, security and science were very disparate, but we've seen a lot of progress over time as they've come together and developed a common way to talk about these issues and ultimately a way to, to address them. I think in general, our approach um, has been really sort of bottom up in really helping uh, let, let, or let scientists help us, guide us through addressing this set of risks. And part of that is because just that approach is because the benefits that come from bioscience and biotechnology are so extraordinary and so potentially transformative for society, not just in terms of human health, but across agriculture, across energy, across the environment. So we can't think about risks of these technologies in a vacuum. We have to be thinking about risks in the context of all of the extraordinary potential benefits that these technologies will bring. And so really our challenge is how do you forge collaboration across these disparate communities uh, and find ways to maximize the benefits while uh, identifying and developing ways to minimize the risk. Um, I want to take just a moment to talk about sort of the, the, the global level to, to build on some of the um, uh, reactions that Dr. Maruta just offered, because obviously there's a regional role for organizations like Africa CDC and the African Union, but within the international system and the UN system in particular, um, because of the role that these two major communities play, they're essentially two kinds of stakeholders those associated with the World Health Organization that mainly think about these issues from, a health, uh, from their health mission and mandate, um, and those on the security side in the disarmament um, areas like the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs. And so one of the things that we have recognized is that while um, finding ways to address the risks associated with biotechnology um, are part of the mission of those discrete components, um, it, perhaps we're at a time where because of the urgency that these risks pose, um, that perhaps there is an opportunity to think about uh, the utility of an organization dedicated to this topic in particular. Um, and what I mean by that is perhaps an organization within the UN system or an organization that exists outside the UN system that supports the UN system. Um, and I mention this here because this is an area that my um, organization, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, is very actively uh, engaged in discussions with stakeholders around the world on whether we, because of COVID and because of the rapid pace of um, technology advances, that we're at a point where beginning to contemplate whether a, in, a, uh, an entity, a normative entity dedicated to this set of risks and challenges um, is important. And so, I, you know, I, I mentioned that just because I think it's, it's worth thinking about. But um, I guess maybe leaving on a, or stopping on a hopeful note, uh, we do need collaboration across these different communities. We have made progress, but obviously there's, there's a lot more progress we, we need to make. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. I just wanted to echo uh, your closing comment about the need for the United Nations to establish a dedicated unit uh, that focuses on these risks uh, globally through the UN system and, uh, and, and setting up uh, such a facility. I think that's really very important uh, because it's only when you have such a dedicated focus on the part of your global agencies, uh, but also on a nation state level uh, and where the initiative also comes from the defense um, in a non-traditional way in the sense that it has to collaborate with other departments that the world will really begin to take notice uh, on the issue of biosecurity. So thank you very much for that. I wanted also to ask Iqbal to reflect on this. And the reason for my turning to him is that South Africa had a biochemical weapons program uh, that was run by somebody uh, by the name of Rota Bassant during the closing years of apartheid. Um, and it's usually countries with programs like that um, that have a history in dealing with the risks um, and uh, where um, there has not been, certainly in the case of South Africa, there was very little oversight of those risks. Uh, and every attack, as um, 
as president, I know, signed off on uh, the shutting down of the nuclear weapons program, and that was certified globally. But there was no global certification for shutting down the biochemical weapons pro uh, program that we had. Um, and so, and it dissipated, rather than it was shut down properly. So, uh, uh, Iqbal. Sorry. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, well, uh, yes, the, um, what happened out of that um, program was subsequent to independence was the establishment of a non-proliferation council um, in South Africa. And the initial focus was on the nuclear threat. And, but subsequently, within the non-proliferation council, they established a um, chemical weapons working committee to see to the chemical weapons program and uh, that you, you speak about. And um, so extra regulations and legislation have been brought into place to control um, chemical weapons and, and their production. And, and subsequently, a few years later, a biological weapons working committee was also introduced in the same program, but all under the uh, NPC or the Non-Proliferation Council. The, the long name is the Non-Proliferation Council for Weapons of Mass Destruction. And, and so, um, so, so those programs are in place and the, the committees do meet regularly and, and they look at programs that are in place. But again, there's nothing forcing a scientist at a specific institute to register. There's legislation that scientists need to register their projects where there may be possible chemical weapons or biological weapons uh, spin-offs. Um, but most of the researchers do not register their projects and so there's still a loophole and so it needs to be tightened up. And, um, and the interesting thing is that the Non-Proliferation Council is located within the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And, and so, um, uh, so obviously one, we, one is talking about cross-representation from uh, foreign affairs to international affairs and health and agriculture, environmental affairs all having to come into the Ministry of Trade and Industry uh, to talk about these programs and regulate these programs. Um, so the things are in place. They're working not as effectively as they could, um, but they are working. And, 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 and it's the same problem that you can make legislation, um, but very often it's difficult to monitor compliance and adherence to legislation. And, and that's one of the, the big problems. Yes, no, thank you very much for that. It is a, it is a huge problem and it, emphasis, it, it points to the importance of developing a culture of responsibility at institutional level because it mm -hmm. becomes part of the things people then take for granted. That is observing mm -hmm. biosecurity norms should be built into how uh, institutions function, how uh, the architecture for rewards and incentives are built into that system uh, to reduce, for example, the bureaucratic requirements that come with oversight. So you, scientists would uh, like, you know, to observe all the rules, but often uh, regulations introduce uh, burdensome bureaucratic measures. So if that's the case, what do we do about that? How do we remove the bureaucracy and still have a system in place and so on? Mm -hmm. So there are a whole range of uh, things that can be done. Uh, this is not new. There are good uh, uh, codes of good practice in place. There are institutions that work well in terms of that. So but just to emphasize the importance of the point you're making, that uh, you can have laws and, you can have, and if you have a compliance approach to it, then it becomes something that you want to enforce on people. And I think, don't think that's the right approach. I think laws are important, the regulations are important clearly, but in the end, what you want to see drive the process of accountability is mm -hmm. the development of a culture of responsible science. Uh, so I think, uh, thank you very much for those comments. Let me say that 
there was another issue raised about uh, by both uh, Dr. Baruta and the panelists about awareness levels. Uh, and I'm going to show you, share a story with you on this. Prior to COVID-19, I had a hard time in my dealing with uh, politicians, uh, including on the African continent, but only, not only there, about persuading them how important it is to anticipate problems coming out of the, uh, the sort of biotechnology risk area. And the answer was usually, do, do, the, answer, the question to me was always, are you quite sure this is something? Can you point to an example where uh, a catastrophe was caused by a, uh, a deliberate uh, a biological threat, for example, and so on and so forth. So in many ways, prior to COVID-19, it was somewhat of an abstract idea um, and, uh, and not something that um, was at the focus of uh, the way in which politicians at the fine, the priorities around threats and so on. Post COVID-19, I think people will think differently because they can see what the consequences are uh, of a natural outbreak like this and how it rapidly diffused across the world, causing great, great harm and disruption in a way that has changed the direction of our history. I mean, it's catastrophic and monumental in terms of consequences. Um, and there's an anticipation that something worse can happen um, and it can be natural, it can be accidental, and it can be deliberate. And so I think um, that people now have a better sense of awareness, but at the same time, everybody's been pointing, as everybody else has been pointing out, it's a lot of conspiracy theories floating around, uh, and a lack of understanding as a consequence of the real causes of, uh, the scientific understanding of the causes of, uh, of this. So there's a need for heightened programs of awareness, education, um, at all levels. And so I wanted to apologize for being a bit long-winded in an in introduction to the question about how one, uh, under these circumstances, uh, reach stakeholders and beyond in giving biosecurity priority in terms of what should happen uh, when it comes to policy formulation and the importance of focusing on establishing trust in science um, and a scientific understanding of problems in this world today. And I, I wanted to ask Natasha whether she had any reflections on that. Thank you, uh, Wilma. So I also want to echo what Dr. Parker mentioned. I think that there are a couple issues here and one, one that comes up uh, often is, uh, if I can say it simply, lost in translation. We have a lot of uh, policymakers and a lot of people that are trying to, you know, put in place um, these policies and make sure that the, the oversight is there and all that. The issue that happens that I've seen before is how that is translated down to science, to scientists, how is it translated down to researchers, to, you know, people working in diagnostic labs. They don't always understand how that relates to what they are doing um, and, and what's happening at the higher level. So I think we also need to, which is why I um, always talk about training. I think it's important to be able to provide some education and training in order to translate um, the, the needs to have the policy and what the wording of those policies are down to actual practice and what that actually means in practice, what, how that, um, in, what, what are the implications to the researchers, what are the implications uh, to the institutions, what are the implications to even diagnostic labs, and, and the other way around as well. Uh, some of the gaps that have been identified from people that are doing more of a hands-on uh, work uh, should be a, a way to communicate those in a meaningful way uh, up to policymakers and make sure that those policies and you know that are being put in place uh, are taking consideration some of those gaps and address those gaps again in a meaningful uh, way. And how do we do this in a pandemic situation? That it, it must be a way to fast track some of uh, those decisions without compromising uh, safety or security when it comes to working with high consequence uh, pathogens, both uh, you know, agents and toxins uh, alike. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Natasha. Uh, if I can call in any other panelists who would like to make uh, any further comments in this area. Well, maybe, maybe I'll make a quick comment, Will not. Um, so I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think, you know, ultimately we have to find a way to not think about um, managing biotechnology risks as a separate component from performing life science research and doing science itself. Like there has to be a way where um, we can, we, we have an integrated understanding that this is a part of our, you know, responsibility as a practicing member of the science community and not a separate set of responsibilities that, you know, are, are the, the job of an institutional point of contact or someone else to address. This is our responsibility as scientists um, who have been entrusted with these extraordinary uh, tools. So, I mean, finding ways to, to integrate that, that understanding, I think will be um, absolutely uh, key. So thank you very much uh, uh, for that. I think, uh, uh, Iqbal, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add one of the things that we recommended was that in South Africa is in the same way that funding agencies, if you're going to have human research, you have to have human ethics approval. If you're going to have animal research, you need animal ethics approval. And, and the same way the project needs to be vetted for biosecurity or bioethics as well. Um, so that the funding agency should be the person to drive that agenda so that researchers become aware and institutions become aware of those aspects. But again, it's difficult for people to, because it's more work now, and it's difficult for people to accept that notion. Yes, there's, no, thanks for that. I mean, there's ongoing discussions with the major funders uh, in biological research um, uh, presently to, in fact, deal with that issue, um, and to build into grants uh, a variety of uh, requirements, but also a variety of incentives so that you don't burden um, institutions with uh, bureaucracy without having some kind of incentive or payment to take care of that layer of, of compliance or adherence. So, so that's great. And I hope, I hope something will come uh, of the current discussions on the way. So then, if I can say one more, one last thing, I think uh, building that uh, culture of safety and security is really important and in order to do that involving um, you know research community and scientists in the process and giving them a voice and making sure that you know they can voice their concerns um, and ask questions as these policies get put in place I think is important they will feel more of an ownership and you know being integral part of the process and therefore you know, um, adhering to it uh, will probably be much easier on the on their end, and in you know building that uh, culture of safety and promoting that with you know further with their students and colleagues uh, moving forward. I think you. I mean, you're quite right. I mean, there's nothing stopping us right now from making sure uh, that in our world where we operate, that for example, students busy with research projects. Uh, the point was made in the chat room by Ames Dye from FITS. There's nothing stopping us for making sure that they work within a framework where all of the issues we have raised here, in fact, are observed uh, and that the process are in place for doing that. There's nothing stopping us from, from doing that on an institutional level. So I think that's quite right. So I wanted to- uh, Yes, if I can just- uh, make Yes, go on, ahead. Uh, yes. yes, please do. Yes. Um, so um, the, there's an important point that I think Andrew and others raised in terms of ensuring that uh, this issue is not only handled by one sector because it's very multi-sectorial and uh, we need um, uh, different institutions to be, to, be, uh, to be involved. We're really trying to uh, make sure that we address that issue when we set up uh, the regional technical working groups. Uh, ensuring that their composition is not only going to be human health, animal health, uh, we also have agriculture, um, people from agriculture have to be involved, people from security, like the, the army, the, the state security have to be involved. 
members of parliament, uh, each of these member states needs to ensure that there is representation on that side to ensure that uh, these issues can then also be taken up to, uh, up to that level. Uh, also including um, lawyers um, for, from the different countries uh, to ensure also that uh, the legal aspects of uh, that are taken case. So the, the technical working groups are really multi-sectorial. Uh, they are not only from one sector uh, of, uh, of, of, of the country to make sure that I think there's that uh, wider consultation and involvement. Um, there's also another issue I think raised on the platform for the questions on how um, I think the response for the COVID-19 now is quite um, um, disaggregated in terms of uh, um, how countries are responding. So I think uh, regional institutions like WHO, Africa CDC have a critical role to play uh, in galvanizing um, uh, um, that in ensuring that there's a coordinated approach uh, to, the, to the response by speaking with one voice um, and ensuring that I think the interventions that we give to member states um, um, are coming from, from not, it may not necessarily be one source, but um, uh, in a way that ensures that I think it's coordinated. If I can just recall, um, just I think a week ago, uh, you may have seen that um, there was a launch of the uh, Saving Life, Saving Livelihood uh, campaign. Um, and this campaign is trying to uh, make sure that as we open borders, we also are doing it in a way that is safe. And this initiative was then launched jointly by WHO, um, Dr. Moeti was there, and the director for Africa CDC. So that collaboration between regional institutions in speaking with one voice to member states really ensures that I think there's a coordinated approach um, and countries are looking up to these regional organizations to give the guidance. So I think um, as regional organizations, we have a critical role to play to ensure that I think uh, the response is uh, coordinated by speaking with, with one voice. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Maruta. So colleagues in closing, let me just say that, um, that when we speak about oversight and we speak about um, what it is we do about biosecurity and biosafety issues, it covers both the public sector and the private sectors. And if you just think about the number of laboratories uh, in, in, the, in the commercial zone. And uh, governments have, um, it's easier to reach the public sector because funding through governments typically uh, go in that direction. It's harder to reach the private sector. So it's really important that in what it is we do, there is a collaboration with the private sector because the same security issues clearly operate there. So uh, we didn't speak about the private sector today, but I just wanted to highlight that that's an important uh, dimension. Uh, when we speak about vaccines, for example, on Friday, we've got Aspen Pharmacare as a major South Africa-based uh, global company that is heavily involved in, in this part. We'll hear from the private sector then, uh, but just to flag that is an issue that uh, requires uh, some special thought and attention. Uh, I thought today's session was fabulous. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Marusa and all the panelists, Andrew Hevela, Iqbal Parker, uh, Natasha Griffith uh, for their massive contribution to uh, advancing our understanding and I'm sure the, the guests would agree that we know more than what we did when we started this morning um, and so that's a wonderful outcome it's good preparation for tomorrow tomorrow we are going to focus on the issue of social distancing social trust uh, what's known as non-pharmaceutical interventions in dealing with COVID-19. The lead speaker there is the director. We're delighted to have him speak. Uh, uh, he's been extremely busy. Uh, Dr. John Kingsagon was a fabulous colleague. Uh, and the Africa CDC, as you know, is uh, the African Union's uh, youngest uh, institution. And it has shown massive uh, uh, growth over the last three years partly because it's responded brilliantly to the challenge um, uh, that, uh, that the continent has faced. So, so that's tomorrow. I was, I'm sorry I missed um, Isabella Yaho, who's Isabella from Kenya, because she would have told us more about East Africa. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Chikwe Kwezu, who's head of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, speaking broadly, but also focusing on West Africa. Uh, we're also going to hear about North Africa specifically from Janus Beramur, who is at the Sustainability uh, Institute at Columbia. Um, 
And so what's been missing today is just a sense of East Africa, but we'll pick up on that issue as we go along. So, so uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to all the guests. I must, uh, just on a, this is a, a personal, uh, besides my daughter being online in Cape Town, Gabby, I also saw that my brother Dion has been online and he's based in Manila in the Philippines. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, by way of this and uh, say that uh, it's important for us to repeat thanks to the institutions involved in this collaboration, principally Columbia University, the University of the Bratisland. We'll hear more about uh, VITS as we go along as well and what they're doing at that institution um, and also the Africa Center for Disease Control. Um, so, uh, and then uh, the funders uh, uh, through uh, Larry Stanbury at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia and then a fabulous supporter uh, uh, Stanley and Marion Bergman. And just to note that they're both South Africans, but based in New York. And Stanley uh, Bergman is the uh, chairman and CEO of Henry Schein, which is uh, probably the largest uh, comp a company with the largest distribution of uh, dental and medical technologies globally. And they've supported uh, this effort together with the Sunlum Foundation, which is the foundation of, of a South African financial services company that's based in Cape Town. Uh, and the CEO there is uh, Ian Kirk. So, and with that, uh, thank you to everybody and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.